There's a new aquaculture industry growing up in the Asia Pacific region. And it's already having a beneficial impact on millions of people. It's based on a family of reef dwelling mollusks, the giant clams. And it's made possible by recent technical advances that allow us to produce large numbers of baby clams in simple coastal hatcheries. Now, this capability is enabling us to tackle some tough problems. Number one, saving the clams themselves from extinction. Number two, producing high quality, high value seafood on a sustainable basis. And number three, creating jobs and revenue in some poor coastal communities in developing countries. Now, I use the term sustainable. It's important that we understand exactly what that means. For an industry or a business to achieve sustainability, it must be technically feasible. It has to work. It must be economically viable. It must be politically correct. It must be socially acceptable. And it must be environmentally benign. We don't want to pollute or destroy the environment. Now, although the giant clam industry is still in its infancy, it's already hitting these targets. And it's proving to be an industry that is clean, sustainable, responsible, and ringing the right bells. And so it's catching on. Why is this so? It's so because of this term and all that it entails. The word is symbiosis. Symbiosis is a fancy term for organisms living together. You can think of it as a kind of marriage. In this case, the marriage is happy. Both parties benefit. And the symbiosis is between clams and a type of microalgae called zooxanthellae, which are all over the place in waters around coral reefs. The relationship is formed early on in the life history of the clam, when it's just a few days old. And this is something that we can control in the hatcheries. The baby clams eat some algae, but they don't digest them. They treat them with diplomatic immunity and send them or shunt them to an area of their body where there's room to proliferate. And so the microalgae reproduce into millions, hundreds of millions, and even billions. So a clam that's the size of a football would have 500 million of these microalgal cells growing inside it. A larger clam that gets to be a meter in length would have billions of microscopic algae. What are they doing? They're using energy from the sun and nutrients from the seawater and from the clam itself. And through the magic of photosynthesis, they're producing biomass, more of themselves. And these algae are also producing beneficial compounds, sugars, and amino acids that they release into the bloodstream of the host. What this means is that the clams have a free food source. They don't have to eat. They do have the capability of filter feeding, like other bivalve mollusks, but they don't have to. And what this means for the farmer is that we don't have to feed these things from the time they hatch to the time they mature and beyond, and it removes a major expense and a major constraint to producing these in large numbers. And it gets even better than this. Most animal culture systems pollute the environment in one way or another. Giant clams don't produce pollution. How is this possible? They have a tiny fecal pellet, but when we look at that, it's composed almost entirely of microalgal cells. When that fecal pellet is released into the ocean, it breaks apart and the algae swim away, so there's no pollution. So what we can say is that when we have a clam hatchery or a clam nursery in the ocean, the water that leaves the operation is cleaner than the water that comes in. In other words, it's a net plus for the environment, and this is very unusual. In fact, in the 10,000 year history of agriculture, there's never been a case where man has been able to harness the vast reproductive capacity of a photosynthetic animal and channel it to human fruit production until now. But there's a problem. The problem is that these clams are so good to eat, they're under intense harvesting pressure all over the Pacific and Asia. 
That's about 50 countries. We know now from archaeological evidence that tribes moving out of Africa along the shores of the Red Sea were harvesting giant clams 125,000 years ago with such intensity that they were nearly driving them to extinction even then. So it's not surprising that they're rare. What's surprising is there's any left at all. And that pressure continues today. Vessels like this one from Taiwan are ranging widely over the Pacific, raiding unprotected reefs for giant clams. And part of my job was to uh, work as a state's witness to investigate how many clams were stolen and to prepare evidence that was used in prosecuting the crews and captains of these vessels. There's another type of harvesting pressure that we call subsistence harvesting. And this is done by indigenous people all over the Pacific. And here a friend of mine, Oro Ikasakis, a Palauan fisherman, demonstrates how a giant clam is killed. We're on the outer reef, Oolong Channel, Republic of Palau. And Oro is killing a clam with a simple tool. It's just a pipe sharpened at one end. That pipe is jabbed into the clam. The adductor muscle that holds the shells together is cut. A big hunk of meat is pulled out, leaving the dead shell behind. And here, Marcus Basio is displaying the meat, about 30 pounds of it, which will be distributed to his family and his clan in the Pacific style and eaten the same day. In a word, the family of giant clams is in trouble. Depending on where we look, they're rare, threatened, endangered, or actually extinct gone. So what's the solution? Well, obviously, the solution is to make more. And this occurred to a group of scientists and graduate students 40 years ago. We were sitting around in Guam, 1974, exactly 40 years ago, and people were saying, wouldn't it be nice to be able to produce more of these so we could attack some of these problems? But it was just a dream. And down in Fiji, there was a group from Duke University doing the same thing, taking the first tentative steps toward understanding reproduction in these shellfish. Well, several years later, I became the principal investigator on a project that was to run for more than 15 years. I was the chief rainmaker, the person who brings in the resources. And our objective was to unveil the secrets of reproduction in the family Tridacidae, and we succeeded. We succeeded in discovering what controls spawning in the giant clams. And it turns out that it's related to the phase of the moon, the time of the day, the height of the tide, and even hormones that the clams themselves produce. We learn to control this all in the laboratory in a sustainable, reliable way so that we could induce spawning and create millions and even tens and hundreds of millions of eggs any day of the year. And this was a technical breakthrough that led to our ability, oh, excuse me, to produce large numbers of babies, tens and hundreds of thousands per year. And we perfected techniques for keeping these young clams alive in land-based tanks and also in cages in ocean nurseries. We solved technical problems. For example, when we do things in seawater tanks, we tend to get something called algal fouling. That's nuisance algae showing up, just getting in the way, the way it would on the, on the hull of a boat. So, we found out that there were certain types of snails that like to eat this algae. We determined the life cycle of the snails and learned how to produce the snails in sustainable numbers. So we developed a co-culture, or polyculture system of clams and snails. Uh, we took our hatchery, which was very simple at first, expanded it by a factor of 10, so that we had 64 tanks. And this was in the Republic of Palau on Malagal Island. The facility was called the Micronesian Mariculture Demonstration Center, and it was the world's first and largest giant clam hatchery. And we developed techniques for growing these clams in the ocean, techniques that wouldn't interfere with coastal navigation or with the beauty of the site. We made a very important step, which was to domesticate one of the species of clams, Tridacna dorasa. Now, domestication means achieving full control over the life cycle and full independence from wild stock. In order to do that, we had to start with the wild stock, produce a first generation, raise them up to maturity, produce a second generation, then a third generation, 
by then we had 10,000 breeding uh, clams, and we had proved to the world, to many observers, that we had actually literally domesticated the species and that we could reproduce more at will. And that gets to the whole issue of sustainability. And then we took the technology in the clams themselves and we started distributing them through training programs and distribution and conservation and reseeding programs around the Republic of Palau, all 16 villages, all cultured clams, and then to the wider region in Micronesia, the Federated States, Yap, Kosrai, Chuk, and Pompei, the Marshall Islands. And this is an interesting aside. If you're in a place with fast internet and you have a nice dinner, you might take a photograph and put it on uh, Facebook. If you're in a place with slow internet, uh, you'll just take your clamshells and put them out in front of your house on your stone wall. And that tells everybody in the village, we have a clam farm and we can eat clams whenever we want. So if the weather is too rough to go spear fishing or line fishing, we just go out and collect some clams and we'll be fine. That's called food security. And so we pioneered the sale and shipment of chilled sashimi bread clam meat to the Asian seafood capitals, primarily in Japan, the masters of sushi and sashimi. And we sent clam meat, cultured clam meat, into Tokyo and Osaka and Okinawa. And the Japanese were astonished that a gaijin, a foreigner, could produce sashimi grade meat and fly it into Tokyo faster than the Japanese fishboat captains could do it themselves. It took the fishboat captains 24 hours. We were getting fresh sashimi into the Japanese markets in 12 hours. And I was pleasantly surprised one morning at 5 a.m. standing on the auction floor in Naha City, Okinawa. The fish are coming off the boats. The sushi chefs are coming in to buy the fish for the day. And the price of gilded gutted chilled giant clam meat called shakogai in Japanese was higher than the price of top grade yellowfin ahi tuna. And everybody in Hawaii knows how expensive ahi is, especially around New Year's. We also pioneered the sale of giant clams as pets in the saltwater aquarium trade, sending thousands of blue and green beautiful young clams into the wholesalers on the west coast, which were then distributed nationwide. And that's really caught on. So that now, anywhere in the country, you can dial an 800 number or call uh, or, or go on the internet and have baby clams delivered to your home within a day or two. These are all captive bred and sustainably produced. And that's an example of what marketers call reach. The same is true now in the UK and the Asian capitals. You can buy these cultured clams. A nice wrinkle is that there's a byproduct, a non-perishable byproduct, of clam farming operation. And these are the shells. And early on, we did instructional videos and manuals to show folks how to make nice little craftwork bowls and lights and things that tourists love to buy. So you can find these in gift shops around the region now. And an important element of clam farming is its application to tourism. Tourists love to look at clams. They love to go snorkeling and see a clam garden. They love to go to a public aquarium and see clams in the tanks. A very good example is the Waikiki Aquarium right over here in Honolulu. And they have the distinction of having the world's oldest captive bred giant clam. It's the one on your left. It's 32 years old. I and my staff sent that to Hawaii in 1982 when it was this big. It was one centimeter long, the size of a human thumbnail, and the expert staff of the Waikiki Aquarium kept that clam alive all these years. It was Dr. Bruce Carlson, the former director, Charles Del Lake, Marjorie Hawaii, and their colleagues. And today, Bruce tells me that that clam has been viewed by more than seven million people, including lots of school kids. And even after the clams die, they still represent a major attraction for tourists. Now, this is my favorite slide in the whole presentation, and it shows the progress we've made in the last 40 years. When I was 21 and still a student uh, learning my craft, we dreamed that it would be nice to have giant clam hatcheries around the world. Today, that's coming to fruition 40 years later. When we look at how this has proliferated, we now have 34 functioning giant clam hatcheries in 25 countries, all through Micronesia, Polynesia, Melanesia, Australia, uh, up through Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, up to Thailand, out into the um, 
Indian Ocean up to the Gulf of Aqaba, and now even in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, at the University of Sao Paulo, where Professor Miguel Mainz has started a plant culture program. And in addition to these hatcheries, we have hundreds of ocean nurseries and protected sites where nobody can touch clams. Now looking back at the original facility in Micronesia and the Republic of Palau, it's still in operation. There are over 80 registered clam farmers in Palau, and this facility is supplying juvenile clams to them. In, the, in Polynesia, the first Polynesian clam farmer was Ned Howard, and he went to our facility for training, went back, started a hatchery facility, and it's still in operation today, widely regarded as a success story. Indonesia, a beautiful hatchery in Bali. In the Philippines, the Sengu Mariculture Demonstration Center, just coming online, and active programs up in the northern Philippines, in Bolinao, Pangasinan, and in the central Visayas, widely regarded as a success story in conservation and sustainable aquaculture. My favorite family story relates to the Watsons. Tom Watson, on your left, worked with us in the 80s, and he's a dad and a grandfather like me now. His sons, Billy and Tommy, are involved in the family clam farm. And Billy has four sons. They're involved, and their wife, Deverlyn. They're all involved in producing clams and exporting them. And we're having reports now that individual clam farmers are grossing ten to $30,000, not per year, per month. And this isn't a place where typically government employees might make a thousand or two thousand per month. So what we're seeing is very exciting: government government employees quitting their jobs and going to work in the private sector as clam farmers. What a novel concept! And down in we hope that catches on. And down in Australia, we have a young gentleman, Alan Van Zijl, who calls himself the world's first suburban clam farmer. And what's really cool is he's backing it up with results. In his backyard, he's producing thousands of clams, and he doesn't even live near the ocean. And what this means that in the future, people could be able to do this in inland areas in the tropics. We find that very exciting. So I hope I have convinced you the giant clam culture has come a long way. It's here to stay, and that it is justifiably an example of clean, green, sustainable aquaculture. But what about the broader question? What about us as individuals? Why should we make sustainable choices in our lives? I'll tell you why I do it. It's simple and it's compelling. I want to leave a healthier planet for our children, for our grandchildren, and for future generations. Thank you very much.